with GH Rice on the University, a platform that celebrates all walks of life. Having said that, it's a it's a thrilling experience to be here with you all today. I'm Yash Dikshit, delighted to be your anchor for today's session, Battle of Rezanula, by Mr. Kulpreet Yadav. I would like to welcome sir on the stage. Please give him a huge round of applause. I would like to introduce, sir, a product of Naval Officer Academy. Mr. Kulpreet Yadav, sir, has spent two decades as an officer in uniform and has successfully commanded three ships in his career. His, since his retirement as commander from the Indian Coast Guard in 2014, he has authored several books in diverse genres, including espionage, true crime, and romance. Winner of the Best Fiction Award for Murder in Pahargan, an espionage novel at the Gurgaon Literary Festival in 2018. Kulpreet Sir is also an actor and a filmmaker. He lives with his family in Delhi and his latest book is called Battle of Rezanda. I would like to team to felicitate him. With a huge round of applause. Also, before moving ahead, I would like to acknowledge the association of Penguin Publishers because their association is valuable to OCLM. It's an honor to have you, sir, with us. We are excited to listen to you today. So, so without any further ado, let, the, uh, let me humbly invite Mr. Kulpeet Yadav to lead us further. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, very good morning to you. I know it's a Sunday and it's uh, 10 o'clock in the morning, so it's early. Thanks for braving Sunday morning and coming here. Can I request you to please come in front? It looks a little odd that all the chairs are right here. Feedback. I'm not going to show you any PowerPoint presentation. I'm also not going to talk about some algorithms and theories and uh, a lot of stuff that you might have read in your college. I'm going to be telling you a story, a true story, all better of a sudden. Now before I do that, I want to ask you, how many of you, of you have heard of the Battle of Rezangla? Please raise your hands. One, two, anyone else? Young students, young people, no. Okay, so here is a story in brief. The year was 1962. The date was 18 November. There were 120 Indian soldiers sitting at 18,000 feet in minus 24 degrees centigrade waiting for the Chinese troops to attack. There were 5,000 Chinese troops that these people had to fight. The Chinese troops had better weapons. They had better clothes to protect themselves from the cold. The Indian troops were not only less in number, they also had outdated World War II weapons, very poor standard of clothing, and yet they were given this job of defending a pass called Rizangla, which lies in Ladakh district. You know where is Ladakh at least all of you here? Now these people, these 120 soldiers of Charlie Company of 30 Kumau Battalion were all from, not from the hilly area, they were all from the plains. They were from Haryana, they were from Rajasthan and they were from Uttar Pradesh. Their brigadier, Brigadier Rena, who was the brigade commander, who became the chief of army staff uh, around 10 years later, he sent a message to these 120 people that when your weapons, when your ammunition gets over, you please come back. You leave the territory and come back because you cannot fight an enemy with no weapons, no ammunition. 
RP, this is known as organized retreat. Come back, have more emanation, find a more strategic spot, and then start fighting. Now, here is what these 120 soldiers did. They decided not to take a single step back. They wanted to stop 5,000 Chinese with just 110 people. And you know what happened? What was the result? They succeeded in stopping them. 110 of them laid down their lives. Two of them were my blood relatives. It has been paining, paining me for 50 years and 53 years old. It has been paining me ever since I have understood. I mean, I got my senses from 12 or 13 years old. So for the last 40 years, it used to pain me immensely that nobody in India knows about the valor of these 120 men. That is Battle of Azangla all about. How did they do this? Yeah. They did this by courage, by planning, by training, by better strategies, by becoming a cohesive, cooperative group. Let me share with you some statistics. Charlie Company of 13 Kumau is the most decorated companies of Indian Army to date. Out of 120 people, one got Parambin Chakra. You know what, what is Parambin Chakra? The highest gallantry award in India. Eight were awarded Veer Chakras. Four were awarded Sela Medals. One mentioned in dispatches. And today, Charlie Company of 13 Kumau is called as the Rizangla Company. Now the question is, why don't we know about this? Now I am not a political person and I don't want to make this political. I just want to state certain facts and figures and make some statements and it is for you to take your decision who was at fault. When in 1947, India got independence, India was a very poor country. When the Britishers in 1857 took over from the East India Company, the GDP share of India and the world GDP was around 24-25%. But by the time the Britishers left, the GDP of India and the whole world was only 3%. Now, the party that came to power in 1947 had two options. Remove poverty or strengthen the military. Today, we can, in hindsight, we can blame it. But the Prime Minister of that time took a decision to remove poverty. In 1949, the current party that ruled China came to power in Beijing. It was called Peking at that time. And they had they were exactly in the same situation as India. It was a poor country, and they had to take a call whether to remove poverty or to strengthen the military. China took a call to strengthen the military. Millions died of poverty and famine in China. In India, millions did not die due to poverty and famine. Less number, much lesser in comparison to China. But we neglected our country. Why did we do that? We did that because in in, after the Second World War, the whole world had taken a kind of resolve that countries will live in peace, United Nations is there now, and countries will not go to war with each other. So India was confident that first let us remove the poverty, and then we will see what is what is to be done in defense or not. In fact, Prime Minister made a very, Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru at that time made a very controversial statement, uh, which is mentioned in the book also, when he said, we don't need armies, scrap the army. Police is enough. Because that was the mindset of that time. Today we can blame, but that was a fact. Because our army had World War II weapons, we, our soldiers did not have even automatic weapons. The coat parka, which you, wear, which you wear in winter, the coat which is given to you, was so poor quality that it was not possible for them to stand outside the trenches and bunkers in minus 24 degrees centigrade. The gloves which were given to them were of such inferior quality that when you put your finger 
inside the trigger guard of any weapon. You fire a weapon, you have to put your finger in the trigger guard. The glove is such poor quality and thick that your finger will not go inside. So what will you do? You remove the glove. When you remove the glove in minus 24 degrees, you know what happens? The trigger is metal and this is skin. It sticks to it. It becomes one. And you can never remove your finger now. It only has to be cut and removed. But our soldiers removed the gloves and put their fingers there and fought. Now the story does not end here. After 110 people who sacrificed their lives out of 120, when they came back remaining, so let me give you an account of the numbers. Out of 120, 110 uh, laid down their lives. Out of 10, 6 were taken as prisoner of war by China. And four were able to, in, in very bad condition, they were able to reach back to the battalion. Because the company commander, all these three, four people who were yet to, who, who were still okay, and he was, company commander knew that he's going to die in a few minutes, but he knew that these people might survive. So he said, go and go down the hill to the platoon, to the battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel Dhingra, and tell him that this is how our company has fought. So he sent these people to to the battalion headquarters. But you know, tragically what happened? When these people went to their bosses, these survivors, and told them this is how we fought, the bosses said, no, you are lying. It is not possible. It is not possible for 110 people to defend their territory where enemy are 5,000 in number. So these people said, the late, later on we came to know that 1,300 Chinese soldiers had died. We had, we had lost only 110. That is the unofficial record, Indian Army record. But China has agreed to 500 people dying in that. 500, that's an official record. By just 110, 120 people. But what is that? So I'm talking about 18th November 1962. In February 1963, Indian Army had already rejected these young boys who had come to suffice, saying that this is how we fought. So the India was not even knowing about this battle, the valor of these people, that they, 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 they succeeded in stopping the Chinese. A shepherd, you know what is a shepherd? Gadaria, the, 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 the person who takes his livestock for you know, grazing. So one local Ladakhi shepherd was roaming in that area. He came to Rizamla. He wanted to know whether you know, the ice is melted or not, whether I can bring my animals. Now, is this the right time? Is winter behind us, etc. And when he came there, his feet froze because he saw 110 people in front of him with their guns still in their bunker. Some are crouching, some are just outside the bunker with a bayonet strike. Because Mother Nature had frozen the entire war scene exactly the way it was. Not even one soldier had taken a bullet in his back. Every soldier had taken a bullet on their chest. Everybody had dozens and dozens of bullets, but they were frozen and they were standing there. So he ran and went to the army uh, office there and the news reached Delhi and Brigadier Rena, who was his brigade commander, he was, he was sent there along with Red Cross and media and they went there and then they saw these brave Indian heroes still standing there with their guns. Photography was done, and that is the first time the Indian Army came to know about this brave count. But still, we don't know. Why we don't know? Because India lost the 1962 war. It was only, only one bright spot for Rizamla. And by the time, government had already decided to move on, to strengthen the army, to, to make our country stronger and more secure, and our borders less porous so that this cannot be repeated and the Indians forgot about this battle because nobody wanted to talk about 62. Very soon in 1965, Pakistan attacked India. What happened by this time in three years at a very fast pace India had got ready. The Indian took a bloody nose. Then 71 happened. India fought another war and we, we won that war. So everybody in India is only talking about 1965 and 1971. In this process, everybody forgot about Rizakla. Now as a child, 
I, I was, I did my schooling from Chandigarh. My father was in the Air Force. So when, in summer vacations, when we used to go on Chutti to my village in Haryana, the place that I belong to. In my village, women used to sing songs of Banna, of Charlie Kutti, right? And uh, I used to get really goosebumps. I'm getting goosebumps now for the, you know, the rather of my forefathers. And I used to come to the school and talk to my friends. You know, this is what happened in Rizamla. They used to look at me and say, what is Rizamla? And then thereafter I went to college. My father got posted to Pune. So yes, I was studying in Maharashtra. So one thing common between us is not only Vardia College. For three years when I did my graduation. In, in Vardia College, I used to go and tell my friends, you know, this is what happened in Rizamla. And they used to say, what is Rizamla? And then by the time I thought, okay, India is a very large country. It's okay. Doesn't matter because so many wars have been fought, so many things have happened. But when I went to the Naval Officers Academy, and there I found no book on Rizantla even in the library there. And subsequently, for 23 years, that I interacted with officers and men in every forum, and every function, every party, every seminar, I used to raise this question of Rizantla, and nobody had heard of Rizantla. And that is when I took a call two and a half years ago that if someone has to write a book on their bravery and give the true tribute to these, these soldiers, it should be me. When I broke this news to some of my senior defense officer friends, they just uh, said it is not possible. You cannot write a full book on one night battle. Right? You need more material. You can maximum write a chapter. I said no. I'm going to do everything that I can to write a full book. I was myself not very confident. I started researching. I wrote a very long preface in this book of how I started the process, whom all I met, what, where all I faced rejections, and how finally I was able to put it. This, this is not a very big book, which is for 178 pages with pictures, eight pages of pictures, and otherwise all simple text. When the book has come out now, 20th September, the book was released, the kind of response I'm getting from people who are not even related to me, not even known to me, is phenomenal. I've got IS officers and IPS officers, doctors and engineers, and defense officers themselves, and a lot of unknown young students. If you see my social media on Facebook, and Instagram, and Twitter, the kind of activity that has happened ever since this book has come is probably 50 times, 100 times more than my earlier books. Because people have realized what this battle was. Why should you know about this battle? You should know about this battle because as Indian, you know, you should know what our ancestors have done and what price they have paid so that we value our freedom more, so that we work harder, so that we do everything that we can in, as far as our contribution making a nation strong is concerned. Also, you may not join the, join the army that's okay. You might become whatever, engineers or professionals in your field or architecture or whatever. The lessons that you will learn from this story of man management, leadership, training, cooperativeness, time management, punctuality, change management, Etc. In fact, I want to do a rejoinder. You know, I want to do. I want to say rejoin the wrong word. I, I want to do write probably another word and see how you know bring out all those things that these people had unknowingly implemented, which is so useful for anybody uh, in any uh, domain that you might be. So this is about uh, the Battle of Azanda. Uh, I would not like to talk more on this. Uh, I would like to leave 15 minutes, 20 minutes for any discussion or any questions that you might have. आप हिंदी में भी पूछ सकते हैं। आप हिंदी में भी पूछ सकते हैं, इंग्लिश में भी पूछ सकते हैं। मराठी में मत पूछना, पहले मेरे को आती थी, मैं थोड़ा आजकल ठीक हो गई। Yes sir। I will read। I। Can you hear my? Yeah, your your voice is very loud otherwise. Mic will come to you, but। Anyways, I don't need the mic. Okay। So tell us something about the research you did for writing the book. You long prepared to mention. What kind of research where did you go with that in these books? Tell us something about that. So, uh, <clears throat> good question. So, uh, there are, there were four survivors of this battle. 
they were living ordinary lives in village. They were all in their mid 80s and late 80s. One of them has since passed away, but uh, he was alive earlier this year. I met all four of them. So first task was, of course, to meet the survivors and know their first year account. But they were junior Jawans at that time, only one was a GCO. Um, so um, I had to, I mean, how do I start? So research is a very, very complicated process. You have to get information from one source and then you have to cross check with another source. So there are about, uh, I think, uh, 25, 30 good books on 1962 war. But they're all about losses. They're all about what was wrong with India. What was wrong with our military, what was wrong with our politics and how China backstabbed us and punch shield and Hindu chini bye bye and all that. It's just all, all the agony of the younger army officers, for example, uh, Brigadier uh, uh, John Talvi, who wrote this book called Himalayan Thunder, which is a very popular book. So he was pushed and asked to go to Nepal, which is Arunachal Pradesh now. And it was his problem of how his brigade commander was going to be faced. And he was in fact taken as a prisoner of war by China, a brigadier of Indian Army. That is the kind of humiliation we had in 1962. And he spent six months in Chinese jail and he was released and then he came to the book. So, um, but every book has got only uh, one or two pages of this article. So some information from the book, some information from the articles of the defense journals like, like USI, USI Journal, um, their li access to their library, survivor accounts, um, going to the museums and looking at the, the items which are kept there, whether it is the soap cases or the arms or the emanation or the uh, paintings that have been done that time. And uh, one of the most significant resources for me was the war diary. So every unit is maintains a war diary. Right? It's, a, uh, it's an account where it's, it's, it's a document in which you write with hand what is really happening. And that was, this document was lying in 13th Kumau and somewhere they were also not aware and I had to request them. The commanding officer was kind enough to make a team and they found a leather bound book, a dusty book somewhere, you know, and they took it out and that became a valuable resource for me. Uh, the media information from that time, books and articles of research written by international authors, quite a few of them, about India-China war, because it, it, it was not just war, it was actually uh, also the border dispute and the things that are that had that been happening uh, in the preceding six to eight years. Uh, yeah, so more or less, uh, this is how I approached it. So uh, about one and a half year was taken up by research only. And after that, it took me about eight months or nine months to put all that into, uh, into a book and take out the things which are not really required. Yeah. Yes, is is the Indian military still in denial? Or they are accepting this that is the reality. <coughs> uh, sir, uh, the fact is, you mentioned you have to notice that in all your research, you mentioned the Chinese are acknowledging 500 it must be a wrong figure. Is there any way Chinese literature, Chinese chronicles mention this that? So, yeah, th thank you, sir. Uh, so, uh, about the Chinese literature and Chinese Chinese admission, what I have been able to find out because you know China is a state is not your information. Uh, at all, but at many places it has been mentioned by very credible writers of that time so that Peking Radio had uh, mentioned live uh, that they had suffered maximum casualties uh, at Rizanga, numbering about 500 people. And they lost total just about 700 or 700 people in, in all. And out of the 500 was alone in that place. So the first question about army being in denial, denial, army has never been actually in that kind of a denial. Um, I'm not trying to say that army has been, um, army has not recognized this battle. All I'm trying to say is that nation does not know and in army, the army people know. Now army also, Indian army is a huge organization. So infantry, most of the people in infantry would be knowing about this battle. Maybe not in that much of detail. Now this book, will help them to piece together some of the missing links and missing information. But army has been, uh, uh, you know, we have, this, this became, became the highest decorated company just because of army because they recognized the data and uh, they gave all the gallantry awards. Yes, the young people should ask me some questions, whatever, yes. Uh, sir, where did the curiosity first start in your head that uh, 
you have to think upon this topic and let everyone know about it. And how did you get all the interest? So, yeah, thank you. Uh, as I've said uh, in my talk earlier, that uh, it used to pain me because uh, I thought, you know, here are these 120 people who sacrificed their lives and what their final moments must have been. You know, they must be thinking that, you know, the nation is going to remember us and we get, that's the reason. We are forgetting our family, we are forgetting, you know, we just, we just fighting and dying for the country. You know, that run, we run, there was a Chola kind of a thing, but it started paining me that I don't think I met anybody in my life who had heard of this, even as an officer. So you can imagine my uh, my pain. And uh, earlier, since uh, my writing journey has been almost 15 years, I started writing by the officer. Uh, but of course, it gathered momentum only in 2014 when I left my job. Um, I have written all kinds of books. I have written crime fiction, I have written true crime, I have written thrillers, I have written espionage, I have written romance. And I wanted to somehow, without realizing, I wanted to get ready mentally to come to a point where I I am in a position to write more authoritatively, in a more authentic way, and people are likely to take more serious because of my credibility as a writer. Had I written this earlier, again, this is not a conscious choice. Probably this happened at a subconscious level that I wanted for the timing to be right, and I think the timing is now. Um, and uh, this has also given me uh, courage to write about some other stories uh, which uh, people do not know that much about. And I picked, a, picked up uh, one of them um, from 1857. It's again going to be extremely hard. 1962 was recent. 1857 is old. And uh, all of us know as Indians, we are poor at maintaining records. So all the records of any battle of 1857 that I'm going to write about, I will have to probably depend more on the uh, British archives than our own archives because it's just not a habit of writing. I hope it's changed and you people maintain diaries and write about your experiences. That's very, very important. Yes. Next question from here. Girls. Hey, girls. Hey. Yeah. Yeah, okay. uh, I think uh, Shaitan Singh, who I hope I pronounced his name right, uh, he, was, he won the Karmir Chakra Award for Simplicity. So, and he was such a huge character in the Battle of Vikramba. So, what's your favorite anecdote about this lion heart of India who's been unfortunately forgotten by so many? Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, Lots of anecdotes are there in the book which I've been able to reconstruct based on accounts that I've read here and there. One of them is um, by by the Etulant of 13 Puma. Uh, on the night of 17th, uh, 17th of November 1962, the Etulant, that time Captain Saklani, who later on became Lieutenant General Saklani, and passed away just a few years ago, two or three years ago, he called up as a young captain to Major Sam on landline telephone and he asked him and he said um, sir is everything okay on the border because he said so Major Shaitan Singh said yeah everything is okay then he started laughing Major Shaitan Singh so uh, Captain Saklani said sir why are you laughing so he said I'm laughing because I got a letter from Jodhpur from my wife and <coughs> and she's saying that uh, here in Jodhpur the cover fell away that Major Shaitan Singh already shahid ho gaye. So he said, uh, I don't know how, but people in, you know, they are saying that I'm shaheed ho gaya ho, and maybe a good smarak banna chi or gaya ho gaya ho na chi. So uh, captain was taken aback and he said, sir, uh, this is, so he started laughing. He said, I don't know from where who manufactures these kind of rumors, right? But, uh, and uh, he took it so lightly at that time. When, and uh, Captain Saklani has written this himself in one of the essays that is that is written about 1960 war about this experience of this. Uh, the second anecdote about uh, Major Shaitan Singh was when uh, the news came to him from Brigadier Rana through Lieutenant Colonel Negra that once your emanation gets over, we've already seen our intelligence has told us there are 5,000 people, you are 120, you can't do anything. Emanation chalao, 600 rounds everyone had. And then D and field 3 not 3 rifles. Ek baar chalao, fir pop karo, fir dubara chalao, so you can maximum to about 25 to 30 rounds in a minute. And the Chinese had, automatic weapons 
in all automatic weapons. Our, we had only nine LNGs among 120 people, but everyone else. So uh, he called the platoon commanders, so three JCOs who were you know, having 35 people each. He was in the command post. And he said, Brigadier Sahib ne bola hai ki ammunition khatam ho jayega to wapas aa jayega. So, what should we do? Now, here's the thing. A captain will not, not ask his JCO what, we, what should we do. He just pass on the order and say, Jolly will do it like this. But this is where uh, Vijay Shaitan Singh was ahead of his time. He wanted to take the advice of his people as well. You know, so the Kadun commander said, Sir, Kadun commander was also saying, Breathe, you know. It was very close. It was, it was one of the best units of Indian Army. So they said, Sir, let, me, let us ask the Jawans. And they went and spoke to the Jawans and Bula kya kare? The Jawans ne bula sir, jab khatam ho jayegi na. We will jump out of our bunkers and we will charge at the Chinese army with our peanut. So rifle kya kare peanut khatam. Can you imagine people, and this really happened like this, when the ammunition ran out, they jumped out of their bunkers, they ran, and here also our management and logistics of Indians was so unthinkably poor, unspeakably poor, that would have been it, unke, unko andar dal rahe, unko ki koshish kar rahe. so their coat parka is better quality and our bayonet also is such a poor quality that it is not going inside. You are fighting, you are dodging bullets and going and doing in a very in a very filmy way. Out if 10 people jump out of the uh, you know bunkers and Chinese are here, probably eight are going to die just reaching there. But two who have reached there also cannot kill them because the the knife is blunt. So that was the that was the state of face. But I think uh, uh, on the other side, we can also say that had we not had 1962 loss, probably we would have been in very bad shape in 1965. Because we would have just believed that nobody is going to attack us in a very nice and very really spiritual country and nobody's nobody's going to attack us because of the good people. And then Pakistan would have taken probably I don't know what all, maybe half of Punjab, half of, half of Kashmir, I don't know. So those three years were very important that we were able to put our house in order and win 65 and 71 wars. And today, Indian Army is considered to be one of the most professional, well-trained, and well-equipped armies of the world. And you're all safe. <coughs> is Rizamda uh, part of our country? Or is so that's a very good question. <coughs> Okay, sir. Uh, the it's thing is, sort of a target. Yeah. Target yeah. It's mentioned, it has been commemorated. There's a lot of uh, memorials being built. Why not in the Zanda? So there is a there is an outstanding memorial in the Zanda from 1962 till now. It's uh, it's in the Indian territory. This is where. Uh, so when uh, Brigadier Rena, as I said, went in February 1963 and he found the frozen bodies. So they were able to count 96 bodies and they brought the 96 bodies away from the past in the Indian territory and they, um, they uh, you know, uh, did the funeral fire there and exactly at that place now we have the Rizangla Memorial and just now on 18th November a revamp Rizangla Memorial has been uh, inaugurated by the current defense minister in uh, at the same location. What they have done now is that they have also made a small, smaller memorial on adjacent to this to commemorate the Galwan uh, fighters, uh, which I think should not have been done, but that's my personal opinion because every unit has got their own memorial. If you just combine, they will dilute uh, the essence of, because you see all the, the entire army is, um, is based on uh, caste, you know, the valor of the caste. So 13 Kumau is a 100% is a Adil company. So that's why the memorial is called the Ahir Dham. So if you if you if you bring in the Bihar regiment there, the, the warriors or Punjab regiment, or you go to Punjab regiment, put your memorial there, then it is basically you are you are uh, you are in a way diluting the essence and the fabric of Indian army, which is nothing wrong. But if you do it across the board, so if you disband the caste and community-based Indian army, which was set up by Britishers and make it composite. But that's that's a very big decision, and that I, I don't know that it is maybe change in constitution or something like that. So to answer your question, we have a very big memorial at the Zanla. It is called the Zanla War Memorial. Then if you just put in Google and put images, you find uh, a lot of pictures there. But since it is so close to the border, and ever since the Galwan happened, so the tourists, which were earlier allowed to go to there, are not allowed uh, to go up to that place. <coughs> 
And what why, what these people were doing was when I say save the entire Ladakh sector, how did we save the entire Ladakh sector? It's 120 feet. So one of the things that was foremost in their minds was adjacent to Rizagra, there is an airfield. There used to be an airfield called Chushul Airfield. Now we have a Chushul village there. The airfield is no longer used. That was the only airfield which was connecting the entire Ladakh region to India because the roads were not there at that time. Right? In 1961, uh, or no, earlier in, uh, in the beginning part of, uh, uh, no, in, in 1961, Srinagar was, was connected to Leh by road. And from Leh to Chushul in 1962, just uh, a month before the war, uh, that is somewhere in October, a cheapable track, they call it, you know, on which a uh, kind of kacha track was made from Leh to uh, Chushul. Right? But from Chushul to uh, Rezangla, there was nothing. So this airfield was very important because this is where for the not just for Rizangla but for uh, for uh, Spangorso Lake in Bengongso and uh, whichever places we have these forward locations the army was located all their equipment rations and everything was coming on this airfield. So if, if you if China just crosses Rizangla they take over that airfield the entire Ladakh is gone. So they were protecting that airfield and that is how uh, technically we say that they were they succeeded in saving the entire Ladakh. Yes, more question. <clears throat> Anyone else? Okay, so uh, how much time is remaining? More less than we finish that. Uh, I just want to uh, take one minute more. One minute. Yes. So uh, you know there are individual heroes in this. I hero ke baare mein uh, There are, of course, you can read uh, more about these people in the book uh, called. Uh, Ram Kumar, Naik Ram Kumar. So Naik Ram Kumar was uh, the uh, in charge of uh, 3mm mortar section. Mortar ko gun hota hai, wo bomb hota hai, trajectory bomb hota hai. That is generally at the end of the company. And uh, Ram Kumar ki section mein, there were 9 people. Right? And during the battle, all of them died. He was the only one who survived, who was surviving till that point. And he had nine, nine bullet marks on his body. And his nose had got blasted away by a sharpener. He had no nose. He was, you know, soaked in blood. And he was fighting till there were uh, there were 1200 bombs with him. And this is this fight took, took about seven hours to complete, right? So if you calculate, he was firing at a rate which is which is optimal for that weapon. But when he realized the Chinese have come at a range where which is lesser than his minimum range because it's a trajectory bomb so it will go to a minimum distance then the enemies come lesser than that there's no point or closer than that so he moved from there and he went inside one of the bunkers he he could have just rolled back no you've done your job you're not supposed to do anything else only six bombs were remaining out of 12 so he could have just rolled back from the mountain and come down but he did not do that because he'd seen all his brothers dying so he went into the bunker and he sat down bleeding everybody was dead in that bunker with a gun in his hand, just just try to picture that, and looking at that opening. And the first Chinese who puts his head inside, he just knocks that guy out. So the Chinese, what they do? So there are three, four holes in that bunker. From every hole, they put grenades and they step back for him to die. And he just gets into the fetal position by a miraculous miss. And after a few minutes, when he got out from there and he rolled. And can you believe it? He got wheelchair and he survived. He unfortunately passed away four years, four years ago and I never had a chance to meet him because at that time I was just knowing about the battle but I had not researched. I was, I was feeling so sad and so frustrated I just wanted to meet him. Imagine, I mean, nine bullet wounds and still you know, you're not giving up and you're giving up, you're not, you're not finally given up because now you're on fire, you know what, you, you don't know where you're going and you just happen to roll on one side and realize that you're back uh, in your video. So this is the final story I want to tell. There are about 19 stories. Do read this book. It's available on Amazon. I'm not sure whether you have a bookstore here or not. I've been asking this morning. Uh, there are a lot of, lot of stores down below. Uh, but I don't know whether this is a bookstore or not. If there's a bookstore, you're welcome to. I'm going to be hanging around till about 1 or 2 in the afternoon. I've got another session as well. You're welcome to bring the book to me. I'll be very happy to sign and autograph you. Uh, if, if the bookstore is not here, then probably you can buy online. And next time when I come to Narco, I can sign or you can just read it to tag me. Will you read this book? 
and tell me what you think. I hope you enjoyed the session. Thank you very much. No, I am not even carrying one book because you know every festival has got a bookstore. So I was asking them. I said, "Me, to book de dena, so I can show you the book cover." But apparently.